Music, it's the soundtrack of life. Calming, energizing, inspiring. Melodies connect generations. Keeping younger musicians in the nation's second largest school district in practice is a tremendous labor of love for a group of dedicated technicians who tirelessly maintain the district's 80,000 instruments, allowing students from every walk of life to experience music education. The Last Repair Shop beautifully tells their stories, and the film now nominated for an Oscar. Yeah! The filmmakers, repair workers, students, and anyone who's ever committed their lives to music in schools will now be represented on Hollywood's biggest night. Thank you for joining us for On the Red Carpet Presents The Last Repair Shop. I'm George Pinocchio. Los Angeles Unified is one of the only school districts in the country to supply instruments to students free of charge and also fix those instruments. The repair technician's labor of love and impact is at the center of the last repair shop. The project, one of five nominated for documentary short film at the 2024 Oscars. I recently sat down with directors Ben Proudfoot and Chris Bowers to talk about the movie, the response, and what the future holds. We'll have more of our conversation and some behind the scenes fun after the film. But first, here is the last repair shop commercial free. I love the violin. The hardest things in my life is probably my family's health. Like everybody's always getting sick back to back. They're like, oh, we have to go to the hospital for them and stuff. Like, wait, um, I'll hear you play in a minute. I just have to get these medicine for them. You know, I can understand, but it's like, it's like, okay. Like, I guess I'll play by myself. If I didn't have my violin from school, I would probably, I don't know what I would do. Don't even jinx me with that. <laughs> There's four departments. There's uh, brass repair, string instrument repair, uh, woodwind instrument repair, and piano shop. With the strings, uh, okay, some of the writings are like a doctor's writing, so. Uh, violin, 
broken peg, please uh, repair as needed. So in this case, old peg has to be removed, new peg fitted, strong, and instrument goes back to student. When wood breaks, it breaks in a unique way. And if you leave a crack open, the instrument buzzes. It can be really frustrating. It's hard to find that last little buzz in the cello. You find it, and you're like, oh, good, it's gone. It's really hard being a kid. Some of them come from a place of love and support. And others come from huge dysfunction. The emotional broken things and the mental broken things are more difficult. You can't glue that back together. That takes time and it takes care. Well, by the time I was 27 or so, I'd begun the process of coming out. It was 1975. You have to remember that this was a different time. Being gay wasn't accepted. People were beaten in the street. People were bashed and killed. So from 13 years on, I tried uh, my best to not be. I tried to grow out of it. I tried to, you know, evolve beyond it. And it wasn't happening. And I thought I was broken. That buzz in the cello. It became me either miserable trying to be something I wasn't or be authentic and be shunned, ridiculed, beaten, or just kill myself. You know, it was, it was getting to a point of crisis for me. My mother and father were both musicians and my mom taught me music is like swimming, the rhythm, it's constantly in the moment. And if you stop, there's no music. Whatever you do, don't stop. Keep going. No matter how bad of a train wreck it is, just keep going. You know, don't quit. Don't give up. Persist. You know? And so I didn't decide. I realized I had to accept it. I wasn't broken. Don't need to fixing. And so I decided to embrace it. Met my husband. We became dads. And we've been a couple for almost 23 years now. And so I'm still here. Alive, free to be kind, be loving, be authentic. So <laughs> it's not easy being a kid, but we try to make at least the, the playing of the instrument part as good as it can be. If you told me five years ago that, like, oh, I'd be playing sousaphone, I'd be like, damn. <laughs> I think I think you're lying to me, bro, because that's not that's not it. <laughs> I don't know how to play anything. Because I could never have at that age an instrument that expensive. Like in my home, in my neighborhood, I could we couldn't we could never afford it, in my opinion. 
I used to beg my mom and my, my, my dad, I used to beg them to buy me one. And they always tell me the same thing. Me, me decían, o la tuba o tu, which means either a tuba or you in the house. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> well, I guess, uh, I guess that's not an option. But luckily, I had a sousaphone at home from school. I was 13, 13, 14. It's emotional because, like, when you think about it, like, right now, 18, fresh out of high school, going to college, barely starting life, and I'm gonna find a way to somehow make music my career, my passion, my, my living, without the two at school and the Susan ones at school. Like, you never know, honestly. For example, brass department, euphonium, leak, resolder as needed, give a sonic wash. This one needs tender little care. A lot of times I wonder, what kind of little hands hold the instrument before me? I have a big jar. I call it the treasure jar, and it's all the stuff I have found inside the instruments. Batteries, marbles, candies, pencils, erasers. This little toy, it's a tiny about this big and it's all hairy. It's like secret communication between the kid and myself. What kind of story that instrument can tell me if he can talk to me? My story, it was a big adventure. Biggest scary adventure. <laughs> I was born in Mexico in a town called Morelia. My mother used to say to us, you can do anything you want in life. You are smart, you are strong. Go fight for what you want. Since I was a little girl, I wanted the American dream, so I decided I wanted to go to the United States. When you set your mind on doing something, you do it. We travel all night. Seeing those buildings all light up. My jaw was dropped. So like, wow, it's even better in life than what I was imagining. I was single mother with two kids, very small. My daughter was three and my son was six. You have to figure it out. I started working at a music store in Thousand Oaks. The owner he said, okay, I'm gonna give you a chance for a week, one week vacuum the cases and preparing the musical instruments for him to get them fixed. So after a week, he said, you know what? I think we're gonna keep you a little longer. Worked in that store for seven years. My son, he said, mom, I would like to try clarinet. $20 a month, the rental. It was a lot for me. I, w I was a single mom, remember? And I couldn't afford it. We were so poor. Sometimes we didn't have food. Sometimes we didn't have nothing for Christmas. <laughs> I came to this country thinking, yes, this is the American dream. And when I didn't have food for my kids, I thought like, 
This is not an American dream. Uh. Few years later, one of the technicians, Mark Como, he called me. And opportunity opened. LAUSD, they were going to hire two brass technicians. You need to go there. You need to take the test. <laughs> when I came to take a test, there were 12 men and myself. I was scared. My heart it was like it was gonna come out of my chest. I thought myself, I have no chance in there. But I remember my mother. You can do anything you want in life. You are smart, you are strong. You go fight for what you want. Night before, with my kids, I talked to them. I said, look, I'm gonna take this test. If everything go okay, we're going to have a totally different life, so. The test was the most difficult experience. Cleaning so many little parts. The pistons, they need to go up and down. The casing and the piston have to lock inside with a little guide, and they fit like a glove. Any little dent, any little scratch, even if it is dirty. It won't play. I did a test. And I went home. I was sad and disappointed because I thought like I, I never have a chance. I think they're gonna do much better than me. I didn't even want to wait for LAUSD to give me the results because I was almost sure that I wasn't going to get it, <laughs> especially because it was only men working in the shop. I just forgot all about it. I thought, like, put that behind me and don't get excited or anything because it's not going to happen. Yeah. And then I get a phone call. You have no idea how it felt. I, w <laughs> I was screaming, jumping. When I saw my kids that night, it was like, yes, we did it. So I start working here, January 26, 2004. They give me my bench all these years I've been working here. Same bench, I never change. Music changed my life, for sure. For sure it did. I started at the age of nine. My school gave me my saxophone, they gave me a case, they gave me everything I needed. This is a beauty. I usually always was in the house, you know, playing around. A lot of energy, like throwing everything down and always messing up. The saxophone helped me in a way be more disciplined because music, okay, I have to be on time, I have to practice, I have to look good, I have to shower, <laughs> I have to brush my teeth. It helped me focus more. When I'm feeling tense, when I'm feeling sad or angry, the saxophone. Calms me down. But the G sharp key always gets stuck. With the woodwinds, uh, we have a saxophone. Missing a screw, lower joint, left hand, pinky, F key. So on and so forth, G sharp key, completely fell off. Complete overhaul. 
So in this case, we have to <laughs> evaluate it. Uh, let's see. The wonderful woodwind department. They all got keys and screws and rods and springs. And if those get bent or rusted, then the instrument leaks. It's kind of almost like a puzzle. You find a leak, you fix it. You go to the next thing, that leaks, you fix it. You might have to take the instrument apart just to get that one pad just right. You do it. You do whatever it takes because for a young child that's interested in playing, that one instrument could change their whole life. The whole reason why I wanted to learn how to play music came from the old Frankenstein movie. Where Frankenstein was out in the woods and the whole township was after him, you know, with the shovels and everything, and he was in the woods trying to run away. But that always stuck with me because growing up, got picked on so much. I don't know what they thought, really. I was kind of in my own world. Some people would say maybe a little off-center. Yeah. Yeah. So when I saw that spot in the movie where the old blind gentleman lived out in the woods, he was sitting in his house by the fire and he's playing the violin, and Frankenstein hears it, and he, he, he almost gets tears in his eyes from the, from the sound, and he follows it. And of course, the blind man hears somebody at the door, he says, come on in, and he fixes tea and all this stuff. And I'm going, wow, the bow is going across the streams, and it made the monster cry and relax. That was such an impression on me. And then years go by, and I was at a swap meet, and I saw a violin sitting there that somebody was selling. It just all came to me. It's like, this is what I want to do. I want to play that violin. I looked at it, and they said, I wanted $20 for it. I think I only had $5. So I hitchhiked all the way back home, and my mom had begged her. I said, can you front me $20, and could you please drive me back? Went back there, ran down the aisle, and I'm looking, I can't find this violin anywhere. I was on the wrong aisle. Went around the other aisle, and there it was. Beautiful, like, lime green felt on the inside. And from that moment on, I, I had the fiddle bug, and I didn't even stop to eat sometimes. I just wanted to play, play, and learn, and learn, and play, and learn. In high school, I took every music class I could. All the other classes were just complete torture. So my buddy in high school, he got a banjo, and then we started playing bluegrass music, fiddling the banjo, and our best friend, Chuck, but he played rock and roll guitar. Bam. We named ourselves after Bodie Ghost Town, the Bodie Mountain Express. So we came in a music store, we say we're a band, we're looking for a place to play, get some tips. Oh, you guys play? Hey, get out your instruments and play some. We had these silly hillbilly band routines, a bunch of like shakers and spoons, played some tunes, a little show, the banjo player, you know, did the funny thing with his eyes. And he grabs the phone, dials up. Starts talking on the phone, puts the phone down. Next thing we know, this Cadillac pulls up in front of the store, and out comes this guy, Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis Presley's manager. And of course, Colonel Parker is friends with Liberace, Frank Sinatra. Next thing you know, we're gonna go to Frank's house, and we're gonna play a little concert. We're gonna go to Liberace's house and play a little concert snap like that. It was 1975, New Year's Eve, at Pontiac Dome Stadium. The Colonel put us on the Elvis show, and it was 73,000 people, and we were the first ones on stage. And we're all wearing overalls, and, and everybody waiting to see Elvis looking like, who are these hillbillies? But it is the highest grossing one night show that Elvis put on. A few years after that, 
They hired us to play at Knott's Berry Farm, and so we played there. That's how I met my wife. She saw me playing at Knott's Berry Farm, thought I was the greatest thing ever because I was up there playing the fiddle. And then next thing you know, Disneyland sent a talent scout and just hired us on the spot. The only thing is we need you in Florida for Disney World. Sure. The Colonel, we had a close relationship. Yeah, Colonel Parker it was. My son's a godfather. Sounds like a made-up story, but I mean, it really isn't. That $20 fiddle I found out of swap me was taking me all over the world. That $20 fiddle has taken me everywhere. And that brings us to where I'm at now. Getting these instruments to play easily for a wonderful purpose. The fact that the kids have a chance to play instruments if they can't afford it. That one instrument. Could change their whole life. In a way, you know, you can feel like, you know, you're fixing an instrument for the future Grammy winner. If you want to kind of dream a little bit, you know. <laughs> When I was three years old, my dad taught me how to play Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star on the piano. I actually vividly remember that. I've been playing the piano for like nine years now. You know, I just have a connection with it, you know? I'm getting emotional. I've just been playing for a while, playing for a long time. Mental health is something that's like very hard to manage sometimes, especially with like everything that's going on in your life, like school and thinking of what you want to be. It's very stressful sometimes. I guess I'm just scared of like failure, you know? Like I'm scared like I won't like find a purpose in life. But once I go on stage, all that tension goes away. When you play on stage, you have like this overwhelming presence and like, you know, the audience is like somewhat like attracted to it, you know? Everyone's just watching you. And you feel a certain power. Something like that. <laughs> Pianos. Let's see if we find anything interesting here. As supervisor, I have to make sure that all instruments are repaired in a timely manner, that shop is all up to the safety and all the employees are happy because we are a family here. I'm a supervisor here, but I started as a piano technician. I always remember the first time I saw the piano. I was a little Armenian boy living in Baku city, a former Soviet Union, Republic of Azerbaijan. The piano tuner would come in the middle of our music class and take the piano apart. And he would mute every string and then go to another one and go move to another one and another one. And I was sitting at the first row. And I'm thinking, God, so many strings. And he had to do every single one. So many parts. How did he do that? Wow. Late 60s, early 70s, my brother, he's 10 years older than me, he bought a guitar. And he told me not to touch it. 
<laughs> One day he was at the college, so I took the guitar, and he comes home, who touched my guitar? I told you not to touch it. I said, well, I just played a little bit. He says, oh, you mean you played the guitar? I go like, yeah. My brother realized that I wasn't just uh, uh, touching a guitar. I was actually trying to play. And he gave me the guitar. I had the guitar all the way until the day I moved to the United States. Yeah. My parents couldn't imagine that something bad could happen because, God, we had friends, we had neighbors that we lived for all these years side by side, and so nobody would think that a war would start. Uh, it was 1987, 86 or 87, city of Baku. They start kicking all the Armenians out. Day by day, it was becoming difficult. We would gather together outside of our buildings on the streets and we would make bonfires and just guard our homes all night. But day by day, there's less and less and less people with us because people are moving out. they afraid to stay. My dad was optimistic because, Steve, I'm not moving anywhere. I never harmed anybody, never did anything bad to anybody. We live in Soviet Union. Our government will never let anything like that to happen. Well, uh, he was a very wise man, but uh, uh, what a mistake that he did. That he didn't listen. He was at work and somebody just came from behind and killed him. Um, Samson. That's my son's name. I was 20 years old. I had to take my mom and get out of there. So we just pretty much locked the doors. We left everything, family albums, and of course, my brother's gift, a guitar. It wasn't easy even to get to the airport because you still look like Armenian, and on the street, people can stop you and harm you. So thanks to my friends, Azerbaijani friends, they took us to the airport and uh, they basically created a human corridor in airport so we can go through it. When we arrived in the United States, they found a sponsor, Ken and Veronica. I maybe knew how to say hello. I had small uh, Russian English dictionary. So if I want to say something, I would just go find the words and show it to him. And when I ask him what he does for a job, he tried to tell me through dictionary, but he couldn't find the right words. But he had this picture, beautiful painting on his wall above his piano. The artist is Norman Rockwell. So he pointed at that picture, and I remembered me watching the piano tenor at the school, in the classroom. Oh, God, is it possible that he tunes pianos? And then, of course, ding, 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 you tune, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we start laughing, and so 
says, would you like to help me around the piano shop? I was delivering pizzas, I was traveling slow, moving furniture and doing anything. And I said, sure, absolutely. You're starting tomorrow. 4.25 an hour, I said, yes. Then, of course, Ken would send me to Yamaha schools, to Baldwin schools, to Steinway school. After what happened in the past, I lost the urge to follow the music, to be in the music, to stay with the music. But life brought me back to it. Ended up being a piano tuner. I mean, see how life is? I love the violin. I think a lot of people see a broken thing and they just think it's broken. It could be anything. Maybe it's public schools. Or maybe it's the United States or any other part of the world. Maybe it's just that $20 fiddle found out to swap me. But when we see a broken thing, we think, oh, with a little something here and a little something there, we can fix the part that's broken and make things whole again. It's difficult work. But no matter what, you do whatever it takes because... It is one of the best things that humans do. That's why this is not just a musical instrument repair shop. When an instrument breaks, there's a student without an instrument. No, no, no. Not in our city. We know... It could change their whole life. Even if they don't know me. I'm part of that.
If you enjoyed the last repair shop, and I bet you did, I think you'll enjoy the conversation I've just had with the co-directors and producers of the last repair shop, Ben Proudfoot and Chris Bowers. We had our first conversation about this movie at the repair shop itself. Now we're sitting down in studio for more. People have just watched your film. I bet there has been an influx of donations to The Last Repair Shop because of your movie. Has that happened? Yeah, both uh, financially and also instruments. They've gotten a lot of instruments coming in because of the film as well, which is pretty exciting. I think it sort of sparked people's memories about what's in the back of their closet, whether it's a tuba or a violin or whatever. And so Steve, who supervises the shop, has been inundated with donations. What is the impact, do you think, of the last repair shop? Obviously, people recognizing music's power to repair. Like everyone in this film was broken uh, in their lives and then repaired by music, and just the power of that, whether you play it or you listen to it, that it has this um, uh, inexplicable ability to help us figure out how to make sense of uh, uh, troubling times or times where words are kind of escaping us, um, but also the fact that music education doesn't lead to just incredible musicians, but also incredible humans. I was just blown away that LA was the last major city in the United States that provides free and freely repaired instruments to every public school student who wants to play. It just made me proud. This whole experience has just really brought me closer to our city. They are both proud to know the technicians who do all the repair work. It's a passion for them. They care about how this is impacting kids, and they're just thinking about how this instrument is going to be back in the hands of a, of a young person and uh, what that'll do for them. And I feel like for them to be dedicated for those reasons alone, and then now to be receiving all of this love and adoration, um, and and to be that open and vulnerable about some of the more difficult parts of their lives, and then have people um, uh, talk about what that meant to, to hear that, I think is just uh, so rewarding. Did you ever think a little girl named Porsche would inspire so many people? Oh, I think the answer actually is totally. Sure, once we met her, yeah. Once totally. we met her on yeah. Zoom, yeah. it was kind of like, okay, <laughs> she's a star. Yeah. And then when she started talking about her love of music and that, that little giggle and her sense of humor and her conviction about why she, she plays what she plays and her vulnerability too about you know, what she struggles with in her life and her family, we knew that she was at the center of why we were making this movie. Wow. So now flash forward for me, Chris. You're this famous composer. Porsche is an up and coming musician. Do you foresee working with her in a film where she's one of your musicians? Oh yeah, 100%, I can't wait for that day. I feel like, you know, she already obviously had that connection to her violin, like that's what we really were struck by when we first met her. Um, and I really hope and feel that this experience and you know her getting lessons and her um, uh, having more opportunities to perform has really cemented this um, identity for her as being a violinist. It goes to show how important it is that these instruments get repaired and distributed for free to every student in uh, Los Angeles. You had an instrument growing up, somebody in a public school handed this to you so you could start off your career as this award-winning composer? <laughs> yeah, so I started playing piano when I was really young, but at home I just had a, you know, my parents could really only afford a little keyboard and they weren't sure if I was gonna really do it. So I feel like my first experiences playing piano were um, either in a music class or at school. And um, I just would always, you know, kind of sneak off into the auditorium during the lunch break or recess or any of that because that was a place that I just felt like, you know, uh, my imagination could, could go wild and I could sit there for a long time and just play this instrument. And so from the time I was, you know, in elementary school, um, my days at school were spent, I'd say, like as much as possible in, the, in and around the music room or, or playing a piano. Chris was an improvisatory jazz pianist as a teenager. I was a sleight of hand magician. And so I think we kind of like come at things from the same thing, which is like, we've got our plan, but really we, we, we like improvising and, you know, plussing an idea and topping each other and iterating. And um, that's really essential to have a good collaboration, especially on a documentary where you get there and it's something different. We keep making stuff together and, and it seems to work out pretty well. Yeah, and I think we also just uh, have such, compatibility in terms of what we think about uh, our crafts and, and um, music and, and film and and uh, have such respect for one another that I think that like 
you know, anytime I have uh, some sort of idea that has to do with like filmmaking, I immediately call Ben and ask him, you know, how do you see this happening? And yeah. and so same with like, you know, it's something that's musical. So I feel like that uh, respect and that um, uh, connection that we have in terms of collaboration uh, is just going to always be there. We've been working on this thing for four years. Yeah. <laughs> so through that whole time, you know, the, 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 this we started shooting this film before a concerto is a conversation. Wow. Um, it, it dates back over four years now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Chris, Chris and I uh, became collaborators with a concerto is a conversation, but we've, we've become, you know, lifelong friends in the process. What has been the best part about this particular experience now that it's gotten out there, people are seeing it, people are reacting to it, the Academy likes it, what's been the best part? One is how much we've all really become this, like, um, have generated this familial energy. Like, you know, every time we see each other, whether it's at one of these screenings or, you know, just at Ben's house for dinner, like, we embrace each other in these, like, very deep, uh, heartfelt hugs and like there's just so much love between all of us uh, in this way and like I think we're uh, you know we have this bond that's going to exist past this Oscar season past the, you know the people watching this movie um, as much as they are now and and I think that's really special we feel very thanked and loved yeah um, and appreciated and it's amazing how appreciative the music community teachers uh, in LA people have been towards us I mean you know from our perspective we're just doing our job um, but it has been, it's been very emotional and just like overwhelming the amount of emails and comments and things that we get um, for, for highlighting these, these stories. You know, for us, we try to direct as much of the attention and love as possible to the, to the people in the movie because that's really who deserves it. We don't make it to make a bunch of money. We make it to make an impact and inspire people. Short documentaries have seen a renaissance I think over the past few years and I'm excited to be a part of that. The future of the short documentary is bright. It is the most democratic, um, accessible, uh, internet powered form of cinema that we have. It's, it's incredibly exciting to think about where that could go in the future. If you really stop and think about it, if you release yourself from all the things they taught you in film school and you're just thinking about reaching an audience with a story at the highest level of craft, you will eventually come to the short documentary. And here, back to Porsche, who will be at the Oscars with her filmmaker friends. So disclaimer, if Porsche leaves the Oscars saying I want to be an actress now because she's met all these big stars, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just want 10%. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyone who works with young people knows they can be some of the harshest critics, not afraid to share their opinions. So how did the film land with students in Los Angeles Unified? We'll take you to the special screenings straight ahead. The purpose of The Last Repair Shop is not just to highlight the hardworking technicians who keep the music playing, it's also to inspire future student musicians. That's exactly what happened when the film was screened at four different Los Angeles area schools. <laughs> I don't know if this has ever really been done before, at least for a short documentary. It's pretty ambitious, but it's important because this is who the film is really made for. It was nerve wracking, honestly, right? You go in, it's one thing to go into a room with, you know, filmmakers and whatnot. It's another thing to go in a room with a thousand high school and middle school students. The co-directors of The Last Repair Shop, Ben Proudfoot and Chris Bowers. Please give them a round of applause. And we were nervous, like, are they gonna like it? Are they gonna talk through the whole thing? What's gonna happen? You ready to watch a movie? Pretty much as soon as that, you know, Searchlight logo came on. Everybody just locked in. There was a screening that was so special where after each character's story, the audience applauded, the kids applauded. Mm. You know, uh, four times. The students, you feel a connection to them? hearing about their lives, that could have been me. 
What I got from it is that we're all instruments in a way. We all have some broken pieces and all those pieces make us who we are. I loved it. I feel inspired. Like, I want to leave here today and honestly go pick up an instrument. A story that would have never been told were it not for this remarkable team. Out of all the things I've done, this, this is the highlight. There was also an amazing screening where Vince Womack, who's a music teacher, has been a music teacher since 1987, he conducted the end credits where his school was there. I have never heard a louder roar <laughs> in, a, in, a, in an, any screening anywhere. Please appreciate Mr. Vince Womack. <laughs> Literally, you had a thousand kids screaming at the top of their lungs for, for this music teacher, and it just, I, I think it sets a high bar, you know. Academy members don't, don't scream like that um, <laughs> at other screenings. <laughs> Plucked from obscurity and placed on the worldwide stage, this entire project has been a wild and exciting ride for the four repair technicians featured in the last repair shop. Their thoughts and the public honors they're now receiving when we return. Utter joy and sheer jubilation radiated throughout the LAUSD Music Instrument Repair Shop one early January morning as the people who dedicated their talents to keeping music alive for students learned their story is now imprinted in history as an Oscar-nominated documentary. Currently, 12 people maintain and repair thousands of instruments for Los Angeles Unified each year. Since the 1960s, repair workers have been diligently, yet quietly, making their mark on music education. Thanks to the last repair shop, those technicians are finally receiving the accolades they deserve. Standing ovations and selfie requests are just some of the ways Steve Bagmanian, Patty Moreno, Dana Atkinson, and Dwayne Michaels are being acknowledged by appreciative students but the respect and adoration expands beyond the school district. You can't imagine how many lives you have touched and changed because of your work. City Council recognized the hardworking technicians at a January meeting, even presenting them with certificates of appreciation. While the praise is warranted for the workers, the students are the reason they go to work day after day, month after month, year after year. When, you know, instruments come here, I fix them and I send them back and I always think who, who end up getting the instrument in the other side when I'm finished. It's got to work so easily. And so that's the main thing, make the instruments play easily so they can have the best chance at, at mastering it. It makes me feel really, really good to keep some of the f really good quality things that were made in the past still perfectly playable. I was turning private pianos before. It's a different feeling. But when you see that product is actually for kids, it's kids' hands going to be playing. So you got to pay more attention to the details. Because if the instrument is not fixed right, it's gonna, it, there's a big possibility it will scare that key away. I tell my bosses, you know, uh, at least every few months. Uh, I just love this place. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for On the Red Carpet presents The Last Repair Shop. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Find out if the film takes home the Oscar on Sunday, March 10th, and join us for all the Oscars fun and excitement right here on the red carpet.